morning, everybody. Welcome to Lighthouse Baptist Church. It's a great day to be in the house of the Lord. Boy, I'll tell you, <laughs> I miss this place so much. Take your hymnals, if you will, and turn to number 250. We'll sing Burdens Are Lifted at Calvary. before you with prayer this morning we come giving thanks for the blessings in our lives lord we thank you for all these things uh, this property and the building and the roof that we can gather under and worship in your glory lord and you get all the glory lord we we thank you for oh for so many things we can't even we can't even count them all lord uh, this covid virus it's been a a knockout for a lot of people, a lot of counties, states, countries. We thank you that it's come to pass or come to this stage. We've been allowed to come back to church, Lord, and we thank you for that. Lord, we ask that you meet with us, be with us here today. Give us a message that we can take out into a dark world and, and shine a light. Lord, let us be a blessing to those whose path we cross. Lord, we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless. Thank you. I can't shake your hand, man. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, me. Well, it is good to see you in the house of God. Things are different. And I want to talk a little bit for a few seconds on some of the differences. You will find that we have to wear masks. I'm going to tell you right up front, we're not in a mosque. This is the house of God, but they did tell us to put masks on, so we have masks. You say, uh, do we have to do everything the government says to do? As long as they aren't violating scripture, the answer is yes. Yes, we do. So we wear masks. We've got hand sanitizers by the doors. You'll find one there. I'm looking at one as uh, you go out that door that direction. If you go into the fellowship hall, there's one over there. So we have hand sanitizers. Do you realize the price of hand sanitizer has gone up? Oh, my soul. Good grief. I mean, I wish we would, as a church, have invested in hand sanitizer back 
you know, so it's just six months ago, we'd be wealthy right. right now. I'm just joking. I'm joking. But we have hand sanitizers now. As of right now, we don't shake hands. So that's the reason I wasn't trying to be rude to Brother Doug when he turned around and stuck his hand out, but we just don't shake hands right now. Don't give each other hugs. Don't do that kind of stuff. You say, well, this is the house of God. Let me tell you what the state has said. We are on, the church is on a three-week watch. Now, it didn't say Walmart, didn't say the liquor store, didn't say the abortion clinics. The church is on a three-week watch to see if the coronavirus goes back up. If it does, we'll close churches again. Three-week watch. This is the beginning of a three-week watch. That the get so you say well so what are we doing we are trying to uh, dot our i's cross our t's with the government and be true to this bible both at the same time that's that's the game plan that's the game plan so if we say yeah you know preacher why we do that you're, you're hearing some of it do you realize everything you're going to touch has been already disinfected this morning here's how frequent we disinfect before every service and after every service. That's what they've said do. So immediately, when, well not immediately, but when this service is over, everything is gonna be in disinfected. You folks are so germy. No, no, <laughs> I am joking again. And then tonight before the service, we're gonna redo it again. After the service, re-disinfect again. So why are we jumping through these hoops? Because the government said do it, we want to do it, we want to be obedient to them. Is it a necessary thing? I'm no doctor, I don't know, I don't know. Is it a fraud, is it a fake, is it a whatever? I don't have any clues on that. All I know is it's what they said do and we will be obedient and not try to be a rebel or something. Sometimes, and I've heard some, I've heard some, their goal is to rebel. And I said it last Sunday from out there, the move that we're doing is not a move of defiance. It's a move of allegiance to our God. Amen. Amen. That's what it's all about. And so we just want to be true to him. Well, glad to see you and glad you're here in the house of God. Let's take our Bibles and go to the book of Luke. I'm going to be doing some teaching, kind of Christmassy. And uh, I haven't lost my senses as to what time of year it is or anything of this nature. But uh, I'm going to be doing some teaching out of Luke chapter 1. I want to look in verse 26 all the way down through verse 38 is where we will be this morning. We are still live streaming and will continue to live stream. And so therefore you see a tripod in the middle of the auditorium and... Uh, you know, probably you experienced it. Sometimes I heard people say your mouth and your voice work together. And so what we have done is we uh, have a camera here on that tripod. And this phone, that's my cell phone, and I don't have it setting up here just so just in case a call comes in. You know how some folks are. Oh, I've got to have my phone. You never can tell a phone call may happen. Yeah, I'm going to be sure my ringer is off. And would you do the same, please? Yeah, a phone call may happen. Oops, it's not off. I wonder if I turn my thing off if I'm going to mess my microphone up. I'll hit do not disturb. That'll work. But anyway, uh, what's going on is, is we download a microphone here and it attaches to the camera. This phone is attached to the camera. The camera is attached to the Wi-Fi. And therefore, the goal was, and the theory behind it is, is that that should bring the mouth and the voice into one place because it's not coming from two different places. And so it should bring it into, and so I hope that's what you experienced. From those that I talked, they, they said that happened. And so I hope that's what you've experienced. So my phone's not up here just so that I can get a phone call in the middle of the service and me look at you and say, hold on just a second, folks. This important salesman is calling me. Uh, it's, just, uh, it's just there for the microphone's sake. Okay, we're in the book of Luke. I'm in the book of Luke, and I'm looking at verse 26 down through verse 38. I'm not going to read it all right now. I'm going to tell you that you've got a statement that's going on here. You've got an announcement that's coming to Mary that she's going to have a baby. And in this announcement, if you understand much about the situation of the birth of Jesus Christ, 
Mary had never known a man. She was a virgin. You've heard me say it before, the word virgin is not a dirty word. We've gotten to such a point that if you say good biblical words of purity, people look at you as if you're strange. And if you turn around and use the same mouth and say pitiful, terrible things, then people think you're normal. Well, it's, it's very, very common that Christianity and the world don't blend. Our mouths should open up and sound different than the world's mouth. Well, there was this faithful announcing. I'll use it that phrase to kind of get me into what's going on here. And even though the message was strange, even though the message was next to unbelievable for Mary, and maybe even as the world sees it, there's probably people today that still mock the virgin birth of Christ. There's probably people today that still think that's crazy. Nonetheless, a, a messenger of God delivered that message. Therefore, we know the message must have been true. Do you remember the man, the, the angel's name? Do you remember his name? Gabriel, that's exactly right. He spoke of the coming birth of Christ. And you see that in verse 26. It said the angel Gabriel, he spoke of the coming birth of Christ. And in the case that he speaks, in one case, he spoke to a man named Zacharias, John the Baptist's father. And now here again, he is speaking and he's speaking to Mary. The message that Gabriel spoke about the coming birth of Christ via the virgin birth, it's still rejected. And people still think it's quacky and crazy, but it's true. And regardless of the reception of the message, never let the reception of the message or the crowd you're hanging with, never let how they receive the message affect how you respond to it. May we always be true to God. Never base your decision on about the, the, uh, delivering the message of God based upon the person you feel like God said give it to. Many times, many times we'll feel like God says give that person a tract or uh, talk to that person about the Lord and we will size up the person and how we think it looks like they will receive it. Now understand the way they look it means absolutely nothing toward the reception. I've, I've felt God say, talk to that person. And I've looked at them and thought, they look pretty tough. They, they, they look kind of rough. I'm thinking in particular of this one biker. He was a member of the Outlaw Motorcycle Gang. And I felt like God, we lived <laughs> two blocks down from the Outlaw Motorcycle Gang. But I felt like God wanted me to witness to that guy. And in my mind, I said, he's not going to want to hear it. He's not going to be kind in the reception of it. Do you realize I had a better reception from a member of the outlaw motorcycle gang than I did from some of the wealthy people I knocked on their doors? He was very kind and very gracious. Don't let the appearance of a situation tell you whether you should give out the gospel there or not. Don't let, it, don't let that be something that keeps you from passing out a tract. Uh, I've told the story about how Nadine and I, we had the children when they were young. She took the girls down a stretch of apartments on that side, and I'm over here. We're in Southern California. We we're taking the, the guys down a stretch of apartments on this side, and as we got about halfway down, I noticed at the end, five guys, they were, had a very bad attitude down there. And I watched those guys and I thought to myself, I want to beat Nadine down there because I want it to be us guys giving out the gospel to them rather than her trying to. And so uh, I wasn't sure if they would be gracious or kind and they weren't, they weren't gracious or kind. But nonetheless, I had the opportunity to give the gospel. Now, if I'd have sized it up, I would have said, no, this isn't good. This isn't good. I remember one time we were out in, in uh, Cottonwood, Arizona. While knocking on some doors in Cottonwood, Arizona, there was this situation there. Man, pretty decent looking guy. And another guy, again, motorcycle looking guy. And so when I went up to that situation, I went toward, they both stand in the same driveway, I went toward the pretty decent looking guy. He began mocking God. He said, there is no God. That's what he said. 
I said, sir, would you mind if I quote a Bible verse to you? The fool hath said in his heart, there is no God. But I turned around and the motorcycle looking guy, the tough kind of greasy, you know, kind of greasy looking, kind of, kind of, you know, it's amazing. He, he's fat, but he, he wants to look muscular. But anyway, when I turned around to him, he said, I'll take the gospel tract. Another time I was out doing the same thing and I was talking to this one guy and a guy behind me and the guy behind me said, our believer is a God. And I said the same thing. The fool hath said in his heart, there is no God. And when I turned around, that guy was like this on me. And I thought, oh boy, man, I have gotten myself into a problem right here. But nonetheless, never let the situation, never let the situation cause you to say you're going to or you're not going to. Just let God nudge you. Just let God nudge you. I'm in verse 26. And it says in verse 26, it says, and in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God unto a city of Galilee named Nazareth. So we've got a city called Nazareth. It's on a hill, physically sitting on a hill is where it was. And it was maybe on a hill as far as location, but it was in a valley as far as spiritual condition. This city was spiritually low. The population at that time, as best as could be deciphered, was around 15,000 people. The population of Nazareth. That was the large size. It was large for that time. And so Nazareth, it was large in, popula in population. It was large in sinfulness. But yet right in the middle of a sinful situation was somebody living right. Yep. Now, I, do, you, do you feel where I am? Right in the middle of a sinful Vacaville, California, you can live right. Right in the middle of whatever sin is in your circle of life, you can live right. You do not have to give in. You do not have to conform. I look over into the book of John chapter 1. In John chapter 1, we find a man named Philip. We find another man named Nathaniel. And in verse 45, the scripture says, Philip findeth Nathaniel and saith unto him, we have found. So Philip is finding a lot of things, isn't he? He's found the Lord. And since he found the Lord, it made him want to find the lost friend or others so that they can find the Lord. That's a common thing. Telling others about Jesus Christ is a very needful, common thing of the heart of a person right with God. That's very common. Our prayer life should be replete with lost people or wayward Christians as we pray and ask God to bring them to Christ. So Philip findeth, first off, or first off he found the Lord and then he's going to find Nathaniel to tell him about it. He said in verse 45, of whom Moses in the law and the prophets did write, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. And then it says, and Nathaniel said unto him, can there any good thing come out of Nazareth? Mm -hmm. Philip saith unto him, come and see. You know, that's the kind of phrase to, to use today. Ah, is it really real? Well, why don't you come with me to church and see? That's right. is, is, is it really biblical? Let me show you the Bible. Come over here and see it. Mm -hmm. See, it, it, that's how Philip handled it. Not only did Christ come out of such an ungodly environment, he came out of an ungodly environment, but so did his parents, Jesus Christ's parents, as far as physically speaking. Go with me to Matthew chapter 1. In Matthew chapter 1, we go to verse 19, and in verse 19, the scripture says, Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man, and not willing to make her a public example, was minded to put her away privily. The word privily means secretly. So Joseph was a just man. Mary was a just woman. 
They were both right with God, living in a city that wasn't right with God. If you were to go to the, te to the temple at that time, do you remember what Christ did when he finally uh, was ready to step into the ministry? How he treated the temple? Do you remember what he did? Right. What did he have to do? Cleanse it? Cleanse. The temple was, was defiled with sin. So here we've got Mary and Joseph living in a sinful town, probably went to a sinful temple, and yet they themselves were right with God. So right with God that God says, I'm going to choose somebody to send Jesus Christ, God himself, into this earth. I'm going to use a clean vessel. I'm going to use a clean woman. I'm going to use a clean man. Where are they? They're in that dirty city of Nazareth. When I say dirty, I'm talking about sinful. I come back to Luke chapter 1. And let me bump the statement yet again. You do not have to live like the world. You do not have to live like the world. I come back to verse 27 of chapter 1 of Luke. Scripture says that Gabriel came to Nazareth. Now he says, to a virgin, espoused to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. Now, let me point out that this phrase, house of David, not only was Nazareth wicked, not only was the temple defiled, but the lineage of David had dropped to a low ebb. Matter of fact, it was so low that and in, into so much sin that you would almost think if you were to at that time try to find somebody of the lineage of David, you'd say, I don't even know for sure there's somebody here. When AD 72 hit, for sure, let me state this, that in AD 72, when Rome came in and because uh, Israel rebelled, Rome came in and destroyed all records. If somebody rises right now and says, I am the Christ, if they do that, they cannot prove to be of the lineage of David. They can't prove it. It's, it's an impossibility. So for them to rise now and say, I'm of the lineage of David, I'm the Messiah. Well, they're a fraud. Amen. They're a fraud. They have nothing to back it up. But Christ, he came into a sinful city, into a sinful temple, into a sinful lineage. And yet in the midst of that all, God still had a, a man and a woman that said, I'm going to do right by God and by each other. Amen. Praise God for that. You say, we live in a society that divorce is running rampant, but yours does not have to. Amen. We live in a society where people are shacking up together and marriage is nothing, but you don't have to. Right. We live in a society that, all I'm saying is, when the society deviates just because the majority, just because the trend is wicked, does not mean the child of God has to be. Amen. Mary was a virgin. Mary was a virgin. It's not popular to be a virgin, Brother Snodderly. It is with God. Amen. It is with God. No wonder they were attracted to each other. Joseph, virgin, Mary, virgin, no wonder they'd be attracted. Let me state it this way. A man that's pure generally is not attracted to a woman that's not. A woman that's pure generally is not attracted to a man that's not. You'll attract what you are. If you want a high, classy guy, if you want a pure, godly guy, then you as a young lady need to be a pure godly young lady because you will attract what you are. And the same is true for a guy. If you want a, if you want a godly, pure, virgin woman, it's not been, not been uh, used and abused and you know, all that kind of stuff, then you be that. You'll attract what you are. Well, they attracted each other. Joseph, Mary, of course, God was in the thick of it. They probably admired the godliness in each other. I can see Joseph. 
I mean, I don't know. It doesn't say it, but I can see Joseph standing there seeing Mary. Maybe he sees her walk into wicked Nazareth. Maybe there's guys that kind of allude things to Mary. She had her opportunity to lower her standard and go off with some guy. And Joseph's able to recognize she didn't do that. Maybe he sees her in the temple when other people are doing things in the temple that, you know, we know how to look godly yet not be godly type thing. And so here she is looking godly when it's a, a, a certain area, but not being godly when it's in office areas or something like that. That's why we put windows in doors. But nonetheless, the point is, Joseph watched Mary. There's a good possibility. He says, I like her godliness. I like the fact that she doesn't wear her garments so tight that the world has to see what she looks like. She's modest. I like the fact that she's not trying to sell herself. Godliness is selling her. The godly want the godly. Well, godliness can be achieved in an ungodly environment. Nazareth, temple, house of David. And yet in an ungodly environment, godliness was there. Were they in the majority? They were in the minority. That's right, that's right. But they still were godly. These two were untainted by the gross morals of this city. All of this says that right now, you can live a victorious Christian life in this time in, or in this life right now. Everybody around me is doing devilish things, preacher, don't you? Everybody around me, their mouth talks cursing and terrible things and bad jokes. If you're a child of God, don't you? Right. They look at terrible things in magazines and on computer and on television. If you're a child of God, don't you? Don't do that. You cannot use your environment as an excuse that'll get you off the hook when you stand before God. God, I, I understand I did do those things you just showed me, but well, God, the family I grew up in won't work. Mary grew up with a lineage that was not right, but yet she was a virgin. Well, God, I can't do it. That God, the school that I go to won't get you off the hook. God, the, the friends I hang around with won't get you off. The city I live in. Mary lived in a wicked city, but she still was right with God. You be right with God. Amen. You cannot use your environment as an excuse for your failure to live unholy. Well, Christian men in the military can't blame the unholy character of most of the military for their failure to be righteous. You know, so many guys, men and women for that matter, get off into the military and all of a sudden, next thing you know, they're you hear the phrase cursing like a sailor? Listen, you can be in the Navy and not curse. Amen. Yep. You hear this? I, I, I have a, no, I can't say a friend. I, was, I preached in a church and met the guy and he told me the story. He said, I got saved while on a ship. He said, I'm out there and he said, I'm, I'm on this ship. And he said, God got a hold of my heart. And I felt like God wanted me to clean things up. And he said, just barely saved. And he, he said, I started saying, what do you want me to clean up? And he said, the first thing God, I felt like God told me to clean up was my music. And he said, so I went and got one of those large trash bags. And he said, I started throwing music in. He said, I was asking God, God, what about this music? No, nope. he said like that. He said, and I walked to the edge of the ship and threw a trash bag full of CDs over into the ocean. See, you, you say, I'm in the Navy preacher. You can do right in the Navy. You, you can be a jarhead and do right. Amen. Well, preacher, I, I'm in the Marines, so I don't know how to do right. Oh, come on. Come on, you don't have to go to that bar just cause everybody else in your group does. You don't have to do that. You don't have to talk like that. You don't have to act like that. I'm looking at verse 28 and the scripture says, 
And the angel came in unto her and said, Hail thou that art, do you see the two words, highly favored. Highly favored. God highly favors holiness. Mary was living a holy life. Was she, did she have sin? Sure she did. But she was living a holy life and God highly favors that. You want know the favor of God? Live for him. Decide I'm going to be right. I'm going to do right by God if God will be my help. Live for him. Well, he said, thou art, thou that art highly favored, the Lord is with thee. And then it says, blessed art thou among women. Again, you've heard me say it. He did not say blessed art thou above women. He said among women. There's other women there in, in, uh, in Nazareth. There are other women there. There are other women in the temple. There are other women in the lineage. There are other women in the city. But she was living holy. And with all the temptations, maybe, the, maybe her peers laughed at her and mocked her. Oh, you miss, miss goody two-shoes. Holier than thou. Can you hear this kind of mindset? And yet, she said, I'm going to go ahead and do it anyway. And when time came and God said, I want to bless somebody in Nazareth. He didn't go to the mockers. He didn't go to the followers of sinfulness. He went to the one that said, God, if you'll give me some backbone, I'm going to stand though nobody else is. I'm going to be holy. If you'll help me, though nobody's being holy, I'll be holy. And God says, I can use that. I can use that. Well, there are four parts of Gabriel's message to Mary. First off, there is the greeting. He uses the word hail. Now, I'm from Tennessee, and I, Nadine's from New Jersey. She's got a more refined way of talking than us Tennesseans did and do. And she used to tell me, Bill, there are two words. One is H-A-I-L, and the other is H-E-L-L and you are not making a difference betwixt the two in the way you say it. H-A-I, here's what I've learned. You put two vowels together in the English language, the first vowel is long, the second vowel is silent. So H-A-I-L, you don't hear the I, but it'll be hey, a, hail, you hear it? But that's not the way I did it. And so I had people sitting around trying to figure out what in the world is he talking about? This angel shows up with her and says, hell. <laughs> Do you see a problem? <laughs> She's not sure. I mean, if, if, if that angel would have spoken with a Tennessee accent, that Mary would have been saying, oh my goodness, what's this about? Well, it was a greeting, H-A-I-L, hail. <laughs> I'm not quite got it, I've not got it down, so I don't mean to pretend like I do, but I know, I know how it's supposed to sound, I'm just getting it out sound like that's a whole different thought. Well, that was a common expression though, the way he greeted her. Secondly, the thing he said was, and it was, it was grace that's found in this, thou art, thou that art highly favored. This part of Mary, of the greeting toward Mary that the angel had, it's, it's, a, it's a grace thing. It's a grace thing, that's all you can say. Basically, I mean, if you're standing there all of a sudden looking at an angel, there would be a, what is this? And so he greets her, he's trying to calm her. Listen, this isn't anything that you need to be afraid of. You have been highly favored. You have been highly favored. Some have perverted the text to mean that Mary gives grace rather than Mary receives grace, highly favored, and that's not the case. Mary is the recipient of grace. She is highly favored. God is gracing her. That's what it's about. It does not mean that she herself is full of grace, only Jesus Christ full of grace, not Mary. Don't, don't, let this, don't let this passage be uh, 
be twisted or distorted. Only God is full of grace, but he wants to pour grace into our lives. He wants to give us grace. And so that's, that's what God longs to do. Mary doesn't have grace to bestow, but she has the capabilities of receiving it. And the truest sense of that phrase, highly favored, one definition of that word, that phrase, or those two words, highly favored, is very fortunate. That's one thing. But highly favored. And it's one who has been the object of the grace of God, but not one who has much grace to give. Is there anybody like that here today? I don't have a whole bunch of grace to give, but I have received a lot of grace from God. I think every one of us that know Jesus Christ would be saying, yes, that's me then that phrase fits us, highly favored. We have been found recipients of the grace of God, highly favored. I look at the next phrase and what a comfort that is. The Lord is with thee. So he begins, surely frightened is Mary. Then the angel says, basically, hello. Then he says, you've been highly favored and then he says basically comforting words the Lord is with you that's a comfort to know isn't it isn't it a comfort to know here in this pandemic that we've been going through isn't it comforting to know the Lord's with us through this thing aren't we glad to know that isn't it comforting to know that though you may be stepping into a different venue in life you may be stepping into an arena that you're not sure of isn't it good to know the Lord is with thee amen I encourage you, live your life in such a capacity that the Lord will be with you in that time of distress or anxiety or whatever the time may be. One may be in poverty. One may be in obscurity in the world, but the Lord's with you if you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. But if the Lord is with you, your situation in life carries no problem whatsoever. Notice as well, <clears throat> Mary is of a low estate. If we were to find her words and to see them, I'm kind of doing a little bit of bruising, but it doesn't make any difference. Verse 48 probably, that's it. Verse 48, yes, that's it. And we find Mary there as she talks, he hath regarded the low estate of his handmaid. So we've got Mary, lives in wicked Nazareth. We've got Mary, got a temple in town that's got wickedness, compromise going on, financial issues going on. We've got Mary, got uh, a lineage that is wicked. We've got Mary, low estate, and yet the Lord is with thee. Would you let me point out the picture that we see so very obviously? that you're better off to live in a low estate with God than to live in a high estate without God. You're better off. You're better off to live in a low estate with favor with God than to live in a high estate without the favor of God. <laughs> Isn't this a wonderful seesaw? Because how many of us would say, I have to have struggles in life. How many of us would say, I have issues going on. I have lonelinesses in my, in my life. Isn't it wonderful to know that we can find favor with God, though a low estate in life. What a Amen. privilege that is. Amen. Well, Joseph is Mary's husband. If I were to go to an Old Testament Joseph, then go to Genesis chapter 39, this, just the same name, maybe the namesake of, of the name Joseph as far as in Israel. Uh, might be that it traces all the way back to this man, Joseph of Genesis 39. Look in chapter 39 and verse 2. And the Lord was with Joseph. What was the statement that he said to Mary? The Lord is with thee. And so I look in verse 22, 21 of Genesis 39 and the scripture says it again. The Lord was with Joseph. Now, where was Joseph when the scripture said the Lord was with Joseph in verse 21? Where is he right there? He's in prison. And so now we get a picture that Joseph was better, and so would you and I be, in prison with God 
than out of prison without God. Let me pause there because I want us to be sure we understand the reason why you went to prison was a godly reason, okay? I'm not talking about uh, I went out and I stole or I did whatever broke the law of some kind of a wicked way and I'm in prison. Well, <laughs> unless you get right with God, you, it's not that, that's not this kind of promise. Doing right and you end up in jail, God with you, you're far better off than out of jail without God. This seesaw that you keep seeing me do is a marvelous thing. If I come back to verse 2, in verse 2, and the Lord was with Joseph. Now, where is he there? He's in Egypt, but he's in the house of a man that has prosperity. You see that in verse 2. It says, and the Lord was with Moses, at Moses, and he was a prosperous man. And so you see him prospering in the house of a man that he's going to be sold into that house and it's Potiphar's house. That'll begin, you see it talking about it in verse 7. You can say in verse 1, definitely it's there. But who was Potiphar? He was an officer of Pharaoh. He was a man that had some kind of a position. So you see him in the house of prosperity and then you see him in the house of prison. And yet in both cases, you see the phrase, the Lord was with him. In other words, God was with him while it was prospering. God was with him when it wasn't prospering. The reason I say that is because sometimes people tend to think that because I'm not prospering, God's not with me. That's not necessarily true. Or the reverse, because I am prospering, God is with me. And it can be seen that he's with me because I'm prospering. That's not necessarily true. God is with us. Get that statement. Now prosperity may come and go throughout life that has God with it. Amen. As far as, far as secular prosperity. Look in the book of Exodus. Chapter 33. Moses so valued the presence of God that he told God that if he didn't go with him, he wasn't interested in leading Israel. I'm in Exodus 33, I'm looking at verse 14. And in verse 14, the scripture says, and he said, my presence shall go with thee and I will give thee rest. Check out verse 15. And he said, if thy presence go not with me, carry us not up hence. Let me make the, the, the picture be clear. There are some that want power and position so much, they'll do anything to get it. But Moses says, the presence of God is more valuable to me than power and position. Go with me over to Psalm 16. How unlikely most people, for most, seems to dislike the presence of God. Well, it kind of gives me a bad image. You understand, if, if people know I'm a Christian, if people know that I'm a Christian, well, they kind of look down upon me. That kind of mindset. They're, you know, if I, preacher, if I took my Bible with me to work, if I took my Bible with me to school, people are going to think I'm quacky. There's one man that takes his Bible. I've had the opportunity to, to uh, hold Bible studies with this man here in Vacaville, and he'll carry his, his, uh, his Bible with him. New, not nearly saved, two years worth. And he'll carry his Bible with him to work and on the break, sit there and read his Bible. One time he came into the Bible study and he said, Preacher, they make fun of me for having my Bible and reading it during breaks. He said in one case, he said one of his superiors came up behind him and was looking over his shoulder at the Bible. And he said, 
he began to the rest of the room mocking the Bible and the weakness of a person who will read the Bible. Well, you know, you know, I, I, I know you know. I hope you know it enough to do it. The point is, in all reality, probably that Bible was a conviction upon that man and he was trying to get that Christian to close his Bible and put it away instead of leave it out because it was bringing conviction upon him. Probably yeah. that's what something was going on. But this I know. He went ahead and said, I'm, I just kept reading my Bible. I just keep reading my Bible. Okay, you're in Psalm uh, 16. Look in verse 11. Thou wilt show me the path of life. In thy presence is fullness of joy. You better take a close look at what you are missing by selling out the presence of God. Somebody may, may laugh at me, preacher. So I really don't want the presence of God too evident. You're selling out happiness and joy. I may not climb the ladder of prosperity, preacher, if I'm gonna be a Christian. So I kind of don't want the presence of God to show too much. You're selling out happiness and joy. Whoa. There's joy without Christ. You are deceived. Mm -hmm. You are deceived. That's right. Look in the book of Ephesians chapter two. Ephesians chapter two, I go to verse 12. And the scripture says in verse 12, that at that time ye were without Christ being aliens, the scripture says, that doesn't mean from another planet, from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenant of promise, having no hope without God in this world. I don't want the presence of God to show in my life, preacher, lack of joy, I don't want the presence of God to show in my life, preacher, no hope. Do you see where this is leading? This is leading down a bad path that you will one day realize that I wish I had the presence of God. Seek the Lord's presence. Seek it. Seek the Lord's presence because the ability of God will come with the presence of God. Well, this Gabriel, let me just take a quick look in the notes as I've typed them. I'm gonna go ahead and deal with this one more topic. He dealt with, if you'll remember what he said back in Luke chapter one, what he said was, uh, hail thou that art highly, highly favored, the Lord is with thee. And then he says the phrase to end that verse, Blessed art thou among women. And there were four parts to what he, how he got things going here. Blessed art thou among women. Among women. Again, I stated it already. Not above women. Not, not queen, just among. One of the crowd, so to speak. You're blessed about, uh, among women. Nowhere in scripture, nowhere is there any hint of the false doctrine that somehow elevates Mary to above the rest of, of humanity? Nothing. Well, it says she's highly favored. You can be highly favored today if you come to Jesus Christ. You can be highly favored and blessed of God if you'll live for Jesus Christ. You can be highly favored. You can receive the blessings of God if you will receive his presence as you go through life rather than be ashamed of his presence as you go through life. We can say that no woman was ever so highly honored by God as Mary. That's all right if you want to say something of that caliber. I mean, I don't know if we can honestly back that up, but it's all right if you say something like that, but don't elevate her to deity. I have had Catholics tell me that I pray to Mary and I have said to them, the scripture I have one just recently that I said this, that, uh, that there is one mediator between God and man. And I said, do you know who that is? And he lowered his head a little bit and he said, Jesus Christ? I said, yes. So he knew it. 
I said, but not Mary. Not Mary. I had another Catholic tell me years ago, well, because Mary is mom and Jesus is son, I go to Mary and she tells him what to do and being the obedient son that he is, he obeys mom. I said, well, in this case, that's not how it works because there's no hint of that in scripture. Mary is a sinner just like us. Yeah. Mary has been elevated to such a degree that the one Catholic church in North Dakota had a, a cross with Jesus <coughs> hanging on it. And when you walk to the other side of the cross, there's Mary hanging on it. The crucifixion of Mary as well as Jesus pays for our sin. Not so. Not so. Don't let Mary get elevated higher than what you yourself can be elevated if you'll come to Christ, live for Christ, be for Christ. You can be that kind of person too. Blessed of God, highly favored, full of joy, happiness, and hope. It can be yours. Let's bow our heads this morning. Father, we come to you in Jesus' name. We thank you so much for the privilege to be back together. We ask in Jesus' name that you would do a great work now with us back together. We've come out of or are coming out of this pandemic Father, may you have, may we have allowed you to achieve in every one of our lives what you desired to achieve through this troubled time. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 We'll be dismissed for nine minutes.